Hello everyone, I'm Roxana Nicola, Chair of the Foundation for the Advancement of Liberty, the Libertarian Foundation in Spain, and this is Leaders, the live stream program where I bring to you exceptional personalities, true leaders, whose contributions to make our world a better place to live, to love, to cooperate, to work, to trade, to help one another, to be happy, deserve to be known and shared, and of course, applied worldwide. In today's program, I will be interviewing such an exceptional woman, Miss Oji Tang, Digital Minister for Taiwan, also known in the community, in the international community as the other China, the free, democratic and prosperous China. Huang Ying, welcome Audrey, thank you for agreeing for, to take this time to be with us in Leaders. Hi, good local time everyone, really happy to be here uh, and looking forward to the next hour and a half. Let's start with a simple question. Who is Audrey Tang and why did you decide to become a politician? And of course, what is a digital minister? Sure. So uh, we kind of invited ourselves in when we occupied the parliament in 2014 uh, in the Sunflower Movement. At the time, the um, parliament were refusing to deliberate substantially a trade service deal with Beijing. And so the people took the office of the MPs and did the job of the MPs, which is deliberation um, in their office, or so goes the legitimacy theory. Uh, and then uh, with half a million people on the street and many more online, we helped the 20 NGOs um, across the occupied parliament to deliberate through each aspect of the CSSTA, the so-called cross trade service and trade agreements, and come to a rough consensus on the street uh, on important things such as um, at a then very new 4G infrastructure, should we or should we not invite PRC, uh, People's Republic of China, the other um, jurisdictions uh, components into our tenders and procurements. And the consensus on the street was no, because uh, they could be de facto state controlled at any given time. Their party can just plug and play uh, leadership within so-called private sector companies through party branches. And so for us, the overall cost of ownership, if we use PRC components, is actually higher because every time we upgrade, we have to reassess the political and cybersecurity risk associated with PRC components. And the great thing about the Occupy is that is a victory. The head of parliament eventually uh, just agreed with all the demands of the occupiers. At the end of that year, on the mayoral election, or the mayor that supported open government gets elected, and the mayors that didn't, well, didn't. Uh, and so the uh, political norm changed in Taiwan, and people aspire to uh, see democracy as a technology itself that you can improve and participate and innovate day to day, not just uploading three bits every four years, which is called voting, by the way. Uh, and that's the, the story of me first being a occupiers facilitator and later on being a kind of reverse mentor, a young reverse mentor to the cabinet at a time, and then later on to be kind of promoted from intern uh, to a full minister, uh, still working in the same office for the past four years now. And so, yeah, I think um, I'm not seeing myself uh, as a kind of elected uh, politician because I'm twice removed. Uh, our president is directly elected. She appoints the premier who appoints me. I see myself working with the Taiwanese government, not for, and working with the people, uh, not for the people, and basically kind of as a Lagrange point between the social movement on one side and the government on the other side to catalyze innovations that serves for the common value, despite our very different positions um, in the society, because we're a, a liberal democracy. And so that's a little bit of me. I also quit uh, middle school when I was 15 years old, uh, telling the head of my school that I am learning things from the wide web that's 10 years more advanced than anything I can learn in school. And the head of school actually agreed with me and said, okay, from tomorrow on, you don't have to go to school anymore. And I would then uh, go on to found uh, quite a few startups, working on web um, technologies and work with the internet governance community, which is a fabulous open multi-stakeholder political system that still powers the internet, well, the open part of the internet uh, today. So um, I'm a rare believer in that the public servants are the most innovative people of all. Okay. 
So uh, I will start uh, with the economic model that Taiwan has. Taiwan is a free market economy. Uh, for instance, uh, for the audience to know, Taiwan is the 18th uh, economy in the world in terms of, of importance and holds the 17th uh, position both as exporter and importer of goods and uh, here in Europe for the European Union Taiwan is the fifth um, let's say um, country with whom we cooperate and we trade so uh, Taiwan it's a reality um, how did you get here to be one of the major and prosperous economies worldwide? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, first of all, because I'm not even 40 years old, so uh, I'm mostly relating on other people's work. It's certainly not my work, <laughs> uh, but I think uh, two uh, main ideas stood out. One is that uh, we believe very strongly uh, in mechanism design in designing a market that is kind of by competition actually creates public value. For example, our 5G auctions uh, of the spectrum is such an example. Um, in Taiwan, broadband access is a human right. Anywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have 10 megabits per second, uh, it's just 15 euros a month, even on the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, that's my fault. Literally, it's my fault personally, and, and I'll okay. see to it that it's fixed. Uh, and um, because we understand that broadband access and before that internet is a human right um, is a fundamental enabler of economies. So the government always designed the auction rules so that there's a lot of surplus money that the five telecoms have to bid uh, in order to win the best parts in the spectrum. But these funds are not... Um, just taxed, right? It's always reinvested completely into enabling the rural and remote and the, at the moment still not very much into startups and so on places to enjoy the first 5G connectivity so that the innovators will actually go to these places where self-driving vehicles, self-driving ships, uh, the, the drones that help the agricultural plants to grow and so on are not a nice to have, but they are must have because of the age uh, configuration, the aging society and so on. These are the places that needs it most and therefore holds the most potential when it comes to the social return of investment. And so basically we balance the, the right wing uh, competition uh, based uh, strategy uh, with this left wing like the social protection of people's health and communication rights and education rights so it's a very balanced uh, kind of upwing um, uh, idea and strategy of how we uh, make sure that the market um, regulate itself instead of a top-down way of like an administration takedown of free speech or administration lockdown um, in the name of the counter pandemic or anything like that that will of course hurt the, the market and so the the other thing is that the self-regulation of the market and the society the communication between the economic sector and the social sector is very strong and so for most of the things, the government does not need to step in. And that's also very libertarian, I guess, uh, in terms of uh, the strategy that we choose. And it really paid off. I mean, uh, this year we're seeing the unemployment rate at below 4%. Uh, the GDP is actually growing uh, amidst the pandemic. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think it really paid off these twin principles of a uh, kind of balanced upwing principle and also a kind of if the government uh, can step off uh, and the citizens uh, are worthy of trust, uh, we trust the citizens before the citizens trust the government. Do you have specific labor laws to regulate in detail how, for instance, working from home is or how can you start mm -hmm. a business? Because in mm -hmm. many uh, countries, uh, I'm thinking here in Europe, mm -hmm. even in, in Spain, mm -hmm. Um, let's mm -hmm. say that uh, you have to pass through several processes in order to start a business that mm -hmm. will take mm -hmm. several weeks and in some cases even months. Uh, you mm -hmm. are not allowed to work from home freely. I mean, there are mm -hmm. several factors that the government has to decide whether this applies uh, and mm -hmm. is considered uh, working from home or not. Mm -hmm. How, how um, mm -hmm. have you managed yeah with yeah. this uh, whole labor market situation and especially now yeah. with the COVID? Uh -huh. 
That, that's literally the first thing I worked as a uh, reverse mentor, uh, as an intern, uh, essentially in 2015 to Minister Jacqueline Tsai at the time, uh, because we were crowdsourcing the rulemaking on telework. And we need to do the consultation entirely through internet and live streaming because there's no teleworkers union. There, there's no such thing as a teleworkers union. There's a union in each and every trade, but there's no teleworkers union, right? Uh, and there's also no uh, business associations of all the companies that starts up and register at Cayman Islands. Again, there's no such business association because they all register on the Cayman Islands. Uh, and so when we want to make sure that a company law is updated so that it both take care of people who to, to choose to work at home instead of the archaic but very well-meaning regulations such as uh, women are forbidden to work uh, after 10 p.m. Um, but if you're teleworking, that's actually when you have time, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, so, so these uh, outdated uh, but very well-meaning <laughs> regulations uh, need to be well consulted and uh, adjusted for the digital era. And so we designed a consultation process v Taiwan, uh, which will um, end up also uh, working, for example, with the Uber uh, case, uh, which makes a really good case as the algorithmic uh, help where the people can uh, save energy and share uh, more uh, if they use app instead of the um, taxis just driving idly on the street, right? But also, of course, um, potentially hurts the existing taxi fleets and co-ops. And so they also need to be digitally transformed and enabled into the app-based economy. And so uh, we also cross those people's common ideas around these. So long story short, um, I think it's um, very interesting that we're able to use AI uh, for me as assistive intelligence to prove that we're actually having a lot of common ground no matter which ideological camp people belong in we all believe in uh for example um, proper insurance for people who sit in the back seat of uber we all believe in uh registration uh, of such uh essentially driving for profit cars but we also all believe in that you have a dynamic meter if you have surge pricing and so on the market is more efficient so people are have more in common than they know and then uh, we make the new regulations and so on using such consultation processes so by the time that I become the digital minister in 2016 we have a pretty robust uh, telehealth uh, and telework uh, regulations uh, which will in 2017 also expand to like the non remote areas that people can elect to do telemedicine and telecare as well and uh, yeah afterwards in 2018 um, pretty much all of the company's registration and everything uh, can be done in a one-stop manner. It's entirely digitized. You can even file your personal taxes in your nearby convenience store uh, without going into any particular um, you know, staff uh, in the government and so on. So it's um, pretty good, I would say. Uh, and all of it really paid real dividends uh, during the COVID because this kind of decentralized um, work that people can use their national health IC card to collect the medical mask anywhere in any pharmacy or uh, convenience store and so on, uh, really helped us uh, to uh, combat the pandemic without resorting to top-down lockdown uh, strategies. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, um, this uh, labor works of, of uh, working from home, for instance, uh, in your case, uh, are you really regulating how, uh, for instance, mm -hmm. a person's how many hours per day should be considered mm -hmm. at working from home, uh, when they have mm -hmm. to uh, sign in and all this kind of, you know, details that uh, normally businesses should be able to uh, to establish depending on their needs, their, their <laughs> company's needs, uh, not like a general rule, or is there some, you know, very detailed general rules inside the labor law that uh, decides what has to be done mm -hmm. by everyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So basically, uh, we have a very large overarching just uh, definitions 
that uh, equates, for example, the check-in and check-out mm -hmm. ideas, uh, what c constitutes as time of taking a break, uh, and also how to proof uh, such records uh, and with distributed ledgers and so on is getting easier and easier. And so all of this uh, is uh, like just seven uh, like definitions of uh, traditional labor law concepts to the teleworking scenario. And that's it, it fits one A4 page. Uh, and then uh, there's guidelines that are not uh, uh, general, but specific. For example, there's a guideline for media journalists. Uh, there's a guideline for uh, like programmers and designers. There are guidelines for drivers and things like that, and which goes into more detail. But these are done by consultation with the actual mm -hmm. people doing those work, not a top-down way of the mm -hmm. Ministry of Labor uh, predefining everything, because there's bound to be other teleworking uh, scenario that we cannot yet think of. So for us, it's more like the uh, equating ideas in the face-to-face um, -face scenario and then just those seven ideas transplanted into the teleworking scenario and that's it. Okay, because um, I, I'm quite interested in this um, aspect because now in many countries, Spain included, uh, the government is negotiate with, uh, negotiating with the unions and also with the, the entrepreneurial uh, you know, associations how is going to be uh, this new regulation uh, labor about uh, uh, working from home? And it seems to us that they are going to uh, regulate it in so many details uh, because unions are quite, you know, uh, demanding of that, that uh, the new law appears to, uh, to put a very, very uh, bureaucratic and costly weight especially on the small and medium businesses that are not going to be able to fulfill with all that this new uh, regulation law um, is going to ask from them. And um, this is a very, very good approach. So I hope our officials here and in other countries that are now discussing this kind of, of uh, labor market regulations will take into account in order to, to ease the, the doing business in, in our countries and not to make it more difficult, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe that is why uh, Taiwan, for instance, uh, is in the top 20 of doing business index uh, this year and uh, we, for instance, in Spain are in the, the 30 position of, uh, of this index. Uh, how mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask you um, a question that, for instance, I know the, our audience is going to be quite interested. Uh, is it true that anyone in Taiwan can literally start a business in 24 hours without having to file endless paperwork, waiting for mm -hmm. months <laughs> to, to have their, you know, mm -hmm. all the licenses and then mm -hmm. uh, having to pay taxes and having to uh, fulfill a lot of bureaucracy mm -hmm. in order to pay taxes every three months? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly the case. Uh, and it's called the, the one stop platform. And uh, we use that idea, uh, the one stop platform, not just setting up companies, but to pretty much anything. Uh, like uh, if you want to uh, go to hiking, and you go to, into the national parks, or you go to uh, the places that are indigenous lands, and so on, uh, there's the single shop uh, hiking portal, where you just enter just like, you know, booking a trip, uh, and then you will arrange the hotels and places for you in a similar way it will connect back to the ministries uh, of interior the uh, indigenous council the agricultural committee and things like that and so on the single interface you will be uh, automated uh, to go through the steps associated uh, with all the different instances the same goes to applying a gold card uh, which is a special kind of visa uh, that if you are a foreign um, high paid uh, talent uh, professional um, in any of the industries, uh, you can switch your visitor visa into a three year uh, work for yourself visa. <laughs> you don't need an employer to vouch for you uh, and then just convert like that and you can stay in Taiwan for three years and even enjoy our national healthcare system. And if you really like Taiwan, um, you know, on the fifth year, you can apply to become also Taiwanese uh, without losing your original uh, country passport. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it's a, a really well-designed way. And a lot of people uh, use that design uh, this year because Taiwan is so safe. They really don't want to go back uh, after they visit Taiwan, maybe for Lunar New Year and so on. So let's uh, get to the next section of our program, uh, the coronavirus. 
why Taiwan is successfully fighting the coronavirus threat? Yeah, um, I think uh, in a nutshell, uh, it's because we have the uh, three principles of fast, fair, and fun. And the fast part is the collective intelligence system. And this is very important because uh, the earlier you respond to a pandemic, the easier the response becomes. Uh, and you do not have to resort to the more um, heavy handed right, uh, regulations and so on, uh, such as the lockdown. And because in Taiwan, uh, we rely on the collective intelligence of people uh, to notice anything that resembles SARS, which we had an experience uh, back in 20, 2003. Uh, and so when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, shared on their social media at the time, that there's, and I quote, seven new SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market. That's something that's actually shared uh, there. Uh, of course, um, you know, um, in their uh, speech environment, that quickly gets harmonized uh, and deleted, uh, but it gets reposted almost immediately uh, on December 31st by a young doctor uh, to the um, discussion board, the equivalent of Reddit in Taiwan is called the PTT. Uh, and so people upvoted it. And then uh, we wrote to the WHO, ask what's going on. And then just as a precaution, the very next day, the first day of 2020, started health inspection for fly passengers from Wuhan. And so this says to me two things. First, the citizens really trust that we are, according to Civicus Monitor, the only truly open, completely open speech environment in the whole of Asia. Uh, and so they can freely talk about possible new SARS cases without fearing repercussions, right? Um, and so because a journalist's word in Taiwan is as good, if not better, uh, compared to a minister's word, um, they can uh, report the upvoted um, idea that there's SARS coming back again. And also, the government trusted this enough. So when it's upvoted, uh, the medical officers immediately started the responses of health inspections instead of wasting uh, time. Uh, they immediately started uh, the CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center, around mid-January, even before we have the first locally confirmed cases, uh, and set up the toll-free number 1922, which everybody can dial in. And, uh, you know, there's a huge call center with the knowledge base, a lot of chatbots and so on, that helps people to feel calm and collected. But uh, most importantly, uh, when a genuine social innovation happens, for example, back in April, when a young boy called to say, oh, I don't want to go to school because you're rationing mask and oh, I have this pink medical mask. Why don't you let me pick the color? My classmate will laugh at him, uh, let me, at me for wearing pink. The very next day in the daily press conference, all the medical officers wore pink. And the minister himself said that Pink Panther was his favorite childhood hero or something. Uh, and so the boy became the most hip, most trendy boy uh, in the whole class because only he had the color that the heroes wear. And, and so this kind of social innovation, a very quick turnaround, literally 24 hours, uh, really helped uh, to make sure that everybody faced the pandemic with this, oh, I can also help. This idea of Taiwan can help uh, begins at, around um, February, which is also uh, the time where we start mask rationing. And as I mentioned, because everybody has a national insurance card, um, the civic technologies, certainly not through procurement, but through reverse procurement, they coded this up. Uh, and then we uh, fulfill their API needs, their data needs, um, where people can very easily see which pharmacies near them still have the mask in stock. And because it's like a distributed ledger, up dated every 30 seconds in early February. So people nowadays, if you go to a pharmacy and you buy some musk, if you're an adult, that's nine per two weeks. Uh, of course, there's also a free market uh, next to the rationing nowadays. But if you choose to uh, purchase the rationing, uh, then uh, the number will actually go down by nine. And in just a couple of minutes, people queuing after you can refresh their map and see exactly how many masks are being uh, purchased by the people queuing before them. So this not only build trust between the civic sector uh, players, but also the pharmacists, the 6,000 pharmacists who are trusted by their neighborhoods, um, don't have to absorb all the kind of accountability, responsibility. The system uh, makes an account of itself, again, through mechanism design, so that people, when they see that we're really ramping up the mass production from 2 million a day to 
20 million a day, um, people can challenge our distribution strategy and use different data analysis methods based on the open API. And actually, one of the MPs, MP Gao Hong An from the Taiwan People's Party, did uh, in her interpolation uh, uh, using her background as VP of data analytics at Foxconn uh, to our minister Chen Shu Zhong, saying that according to the open street map, open source uh, um, community, your distribution, well, it seems fair, it's not exactly fair, and here is why. And instead of defending, the minister simply said, legislator teach us, uh, at the very next day, we rolled out the 24-hour pre-ordering system at a convenience store, uh, and the uh, uh, MP Gao was, of course, very happy and say, yesterday's interpolation become tomorrow's uh, improvement, and this is our premier smiling very happily. And so this is co-creation. And finally, um, because we understand people uh, feel um, anxious during a pandemic, we always make sure that our scientific facts are communicated using cute dog memes. And so literally our spokes dog, uh, sorry, the spokes dog is, um, I think this one, um, it's called Zong Chai. Uh, and then the spokes dog here reminds you uh, to wear your mask to protect yourself from your own unwashed hands. So there's nothing like altruistic or collectivist or whatever about this message. This is pure out of self-interest because we know the virus can survive on hard surfaces for days. It's likely that your hand will touch the virus at some point. So uh, wash your hands with soap is as important as wearing a mask. And the mask is there to remind yourself, don't touch your face without washing it. Uh, and so by making this essentially a, again, libertarian message, not a collectivist message, um, it actually increased our, our value of people willing to share this message because make uh, sense, uh, even if a few people practice it, it protects themselves from themselves, right? So people share it much more willingly the same goes for our social distancing rules, which is measured by the number of dogs, um, like two Shiba Inu outdoor and three indoors. Remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. And so all in all, we make sure that our science, uh, the humor, uh, spreads faster than the conspiracy theories, the rumor. Uh, and so that is why we still remain calm and collected uh, during the pandemic and why the three quarter of people willingly put on the face masks um, around March, uh, April time, uh, and where the R value become less than one and we no longer have a pandemic going in Taiwan. Many people, especially here in Spain and uh, across Europe, would criticize without knowing, of course, how the private-based healthcare system works for everyone in Taiwan. Can you explain how this system uh, works in order to not leave people uh, without medical care, even if they cannot afford it uh, in a daily life? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so the national healthcare system uh, is single payer. It covers not only 99.99% of citizens, but also residents. Uh, and it, it's important because um, uh, if we fail the health care for, say, migrant workers uh, and so on, then we fail as a society when it comes to public health. Uh, and so uh, including them in the health care net is actually amortized. Uh, more cost saving than excluding them and leave them in the hands of private uh, insurers. Uh, and so that's the basic health care. But on top of the basic health care, of course, there's a vibrant medical um, uh, business uh, industry for the not strictly necessary, but um, maybe look, um, make people look pretty pretty and things like that. Uh, those <laughs> more cosmetic uh, and more um, uh, fashionable uh, kind of um, uh, medical applications. Uh, Taiwan is very strong in that too. Uh, and so uh, we at once um, have a really good social safety net uh, to make sure that the uh, PPEs and uh, fundamental rights to visit the clinic uh, and uh, not incur a financial burden so people can feel at ease to report COVID-like symptoms uh, that protects everybody. But then on top of it, we also have a thriving uh, biomedical business sector. Mm -hmm. Is the government uh, really managing the whole hospitals, the clinics where uh, the, the patients go to, to get treated or they are no, completely no, derived to, to are, private no, companies, no. foundations and yeah. other kinds of civil mm -hmm. society entities? 
Yeah, of course. The the hospitals and clinics they are not uh, government run. I mean, there are a few government run, uh, especially in the places who are like too remote and rural, mm -hmm. and uh, people would not. Uh, it wouldn't make business sense uh, mm -hmm. to start a hospital there. And of course, uh, the government, although uh, many uh, religious communities mm -hmm. also crowdfund uh, instead of hospital there too. But if uh, even those religious communities cannot crowdfund, then at the end, uh, the government will do that but that's uh, strictly in a minority uh, mm -hmm. of the numbers of hospitals so many hospitals as I said uh, make uh, money through kind of uh, optional and opt-in uh, treatments uh, but the basic health care that like the right of health mm -hmm. uh, is managed by the national insurance so the mm -hmm. insurance is national yeah. but the uh, hospital and clinics are private Exactly. Or could be private, but they don't manage uh, literally the hospitals like uh, here right. in in Spain and otherwise because it's a very often misconception that uh, many people uh, fear that if the hospitals are not run literally run by the government by the state, then uh, the people are going to die on the streets without health care without proper treatment. And uh, this is a, a, a very important thing to, uh, to understand and to make people here in, in Europe uh, understand that it's not, uh, it's not the same. And for instance, in the case of Taiwan, the healthcare system mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. run with private incentives of, of free mm -hmm. market, uh, really delivered mm -hmm. and uh, let's say protected mm -hmm. the whole population mm -hmm. from uh, the COVID-19 mm -hmm. and all the other pathologies. Um, mm -hmm. this, is, this is the main aspect. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And there are also large uh, um, like corporations that run both a insurance service like life insurance service and also runs their own privately held hospitals uh, and also even privately held uh, universities mm -hmm. that teaches uh, the medical practitioner. So it, it's normal in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So uh, one is the right of universal access to health care doesn't mean that a politician has to uh, administer and, and manage the hospital you, where you are going to be treated. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. This is why, for instance, pues, uh, the, the libertarian way of approaching it is more similar mm -hmm. to what uh, the system in Taiwan mm -hmm. uh, has than yeah, yeah, the one we have here. Essentially a financial design, right? a market design. It is not go to the front lines and micromanaging things. Yeah. yeah. Where are the most, what are the most important, let's say, uh, three measures any government should apply to successfully um, fight this, uh, this uh, mm -hmm. healthcare cri crisis in, mm -hmm. in general? What do you believe uh, mm -hmm. there will be three, yeah, three uh, main yeah, I, aspects? I, I, I think I, I just said that, right? Fast, fair and fun. Mm -hmm. uh, fast in terms of uh, timely response to the citizens' ideas and uh, respond to citizens in the here and now. Uh, fair in terms of the basic PPEs such as masks and so on, uh, and uh, of course very important soap and alcohol, hand sanitizers and so on, so that people can witness the fairness of the system through, say, participatory accountability, not necessarily blindly trusting the government, but through distributed ledgers and other digital means, people can actually audit the system by themselves in a participatory way, which is an additional layer of fairness mm -hmm. and also the humor over rumor um, the use of memes uh, like literally internet memes because when people laughed about something we're literally unable to associate it uh, in long-term memory with outrage mm -hmm. uh, and because so many conspiracy theory travels on outrage we you can't fight fire with fire and so people who like professional comedians working with the government is very important because you need to get the, the fun uh, the, the memes out before the day closes because when people feel enraged about something and they go to sleep with that rage uh, and then they wake up it, the long-term association is going to be on that outrage uh, and so responding within a couple of hours very important tell us a, a bit about the solidarity program taiwan started since the the this crisis taiwan helps taiwan ha can help mm -hmm. sure uh yeah you can read all about it uh actually in the um website taiwan can help that us uh, and the, the website, uh, I think, is very interesting because uh, also in a very uh, libertarian way, because it's not at all done by the government. 
Uh, it is done by a bunch of essentially YouTubers uh, and um, who crowdfunded this whole thing uh, that asked who can help and said Taiwan can help and said that um, you're not alone. Taiwan's with you. We know what you're going through. We know how hard it was in SARS epidemic. Uh, we have been isolated from World Health Organization. So we know how bad isolation feels like. And, and we're contributing to international efforts. And then uh, the timeline of our counter COVID uh, playbook, the Taiwan model, and then a very special crash course on epidemiology by our at the time uh, Vice President Chen Jianren, who is also the textbook author of epidemiology. So he is both the top pu public health expert, but also the pop public political authority, which is very rare. And then Hi, you can hear Dr. Chen Jianren, who was around, uh, actually our hero in countering SARS 1.0. Uh, now the hero returns uh, and then talks about SARS 2.0. <laughs> and uh, of course, it's translated to English and everybody can uh, just remix it into different YouTube creations, uh, which you can find all about in hashtag Taiwan can help. And last but not the least, you can see that more than 700,000 citizens dedicated all, um, more than 6 million medical masks for humanitarian assistance. Of course, that's um, only about, I think, um, one tenth or something of the entire dedication from our, um, you know, public sector and the industrial sector. Uh, but uh, still, it's something, right? It's from the social sector. So anyone who uh, don't need that much rationed mask, maybe because they're uh, very clever and already bought plenty uh, before the pandemic and have plenty of them at home, they can elect to not collect the ration medical mask and then donate it uh, either anonymously or with their name shown, uh, like this is my name, so I will search for my own name. And you can see that out of the humanitarian aid that we provided, uh, 33 uh, masks are under my name. But actually, I only dedicated six. Uh, the other are from uh, people who share parts of my name. Uh, so basically, it's a um, data collaborative uh, where people can uh, trade uh, the, uh, the right for collecting the racial mask to the right to be to brag about uh, their dedication to humanitarian aid and is a kind of marketplace, except of course, it's not trading Bitcoin or Ethereum, but trading mask uh, for the right to uh, to be shared on social media. And so that's part of the Taiwan Can Help uh, campaign as well. And you can read all about it and Taiwan Can Help. I was saying that Taiwan is a key member of the um, uh, information and communication technology industry worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, what were the main uh, reforms Taiwan did, apart from the one platform you already mentioned earlier? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. Uh, and I think uh, there are uh, a few things, but I want to share my office, um, which is this, you're looking literally at my office. Uh, this is the <laughs> Social Innovation Lab. Uh, it's at heart of Taipei City. Um, oh. And it used to be an Air Force um, kind of castle-like uh, <laughs> fortress, uh, but we tore down all the walls and now it's a park mm. that anybody can walk in. Um, and um, these mm. soccer fields you see here are paintings by people with Down mm. syndrome and uh, they have very unique perspective uh, into the space so that you, when you step into it, you're, um, you feel that you want to start up something, you want to do something creative. So, for example, when the uh, mayor of Prague, Zdenek uh, um, Grid, uh, visited Taipei, uh, he and his team uh, of, um, I think they're uh, Pirate Party people, um, just climbed uh, on the, um, this public installation art uh, and uh, just demonstrated a very playful mood. And everybody can visit me uh, with their digital ideas every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, and have a 40 minutes of my time or 14 if they need a shorter consultation. Um, the only thing I ask is that everything that we talk about will be made public through either a transcript or a video. Um, and because of that, people can safely talk about the four aspects of the digital transformation, and that's digitization, like replacing the wooden seals uh, with electronic signatures uh, so that you can start a new company sooner. 
um, innovation, like those self-driving vehicles uh, that are emerging technologies uh, that promise to transform our lives. So we don't need, um, you know, human assistance carrying the flowers in the flower market, uh, or we don't need to kind of spray the, the fertilizers and things like that in the field. And the, those self-driving cars and vehicles will do it all for, for us. Uh, but also the governance part, which is making sure the society understands the impact of the technology that has on the society and inclusion, which is making sure that people who are closest to the pain, who suffer the most at the moment from the society, actually have the first chance to make use of such digital innovations and work the best uh, with the startups and micro and small medium enterprises, which is entrepreneurial spirit, because uh, for large businesses, there's less incentive for them to work in the less included areas. And so all four pillars need to balance itself. And we do this through those radically transparent consultations uh, where people just bring their self-driving vehicles and ask uh, how are you going to make it into uh, more human friendly uh, and more friendly to society observe the social norms uh, instead of one eye we make it two eyes uh, we make sure that it can read people's emotions and people can read its emotions uh, and things like that and experiment for like half a year or so in a sandbox before rolling it out in the field so that's the SDG idea effective partnership and the key word is on effective only when introducing those ideas we make sure that they are always a trilingual a trisectoral collaboration so in the social innovation lab every year now we host the judge panel of the presidential hackathon where 200 or more teams around the globe um, demonstrate how to use data to improve society and the top five winning teams receive a trophy from our president Dr. Tsai Ing-wen for their work for example on using AI to repair water pipes more quickly to reduce plastics by a uh, essentially a Pokemon Go like app uh, that uh, incentivize people to refill their bottles um, there's many wild ideas and uh, each of the winners receive a shaped um, trophy like Taiwan and with a micro projector underneath that when they turn on the micro projector it projects our president Dr. Tsai Ing-wen handing you the trophy and promising whatever your startup did in the past three months will become public policy in the next 12 months we'll do all the regulation personnel and also um, the arrangement of budgets to make sure that the infrastructure for your innovation to thrive is there so this presidential power as a essentially a startup hackathon prize uh, and so this basically motivated public sector to innovate along with the private and the social sector because they know that this will work out better for everybody involved in the cross-sectoral manner uh, I want to ask you if you could give us a couple of examples of um, uh, Taiwanese technology that we might all have at our home on our smart devices, mm -hmm. because I want uh, people to mm -hmm. understand that we are one global world, that uh, mm -hmm. products manufactured mm -hmm. in your country uh, mm -hmm. come and uh, make our, our lives better here in Spain and mm -hmm. in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, the thing is that um, you're probably going to know uh, more about uh, bubble tea uh, than ta Taiwan Semiconductor. Um, <laughs> but the Taiwan Semiconductor Company, of course, probably um, actually with near certainty powers uh, your electronic devices, whether it's an AI chip, whether it's a mobile phone chip or anything that is advanced, uh, like an iPhone or whatever, um, they basically are the TSMC's uh, main um, ideas of getting through to the semiconductor world with the cutting edge AI and uh, delivery on the devices so that uh, if your phone do anything like machine learning or th uh, things like visual cognition like Siri, I personally work with the Siri team for six uh, years uh, um, understanding more than English uh, human languages uh, for the Siri, then those assistive intelligences, the devices that computes them, the optical and audio sensors that 
that makes up uh, the kind of outer shell. Um, I think a majority of the Tesla cars components and so on came from Taiwan, although it was not branded uh, as Taiwan as the bubble teas are. Uh, so maybe maybe bubble teas still uh, are easier to remember. <laughs> but uh, uh, of course, uh, there are also international brands like for bicycles, the giant uh, is a giant in many jurisdictions, uh, although it didn't quite say Taiwan giant. So you may or may not know that is a Taiwanese brand. Uh, the same goes for BenQ or Acer or Asus and things like that. Mm. Actually, I, I have it on my Revolut wallet, the, the Taiwan Semiconductor <laughs> Corporation. So <laughs> I personally right. know the, the great uh, work uh, they are providing uh, all, all our uh, society. So let's get to another section to uh, Taiwan today, civil liberties, not just economic freedom. But uh, to start with, I would like to convey to you our condolences for the late President Li Teng Hui who passed away at the end of uh, July. He was the one of the main, uh, let's say, actors in the transformation towards democracy of your country. So we are deeply sorry for, for your loss. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. How was, uh, ca can you tell us a bit about the transition uh, from an authoritarian mm -hmm. government to the today's Taiwan, a liberal democracy mm -hmm. where civil rights uh, where human rights are fully, fully protected and respected and where people uh, can live their lives the way they see fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think uh, President Lee uh, really did uh, the, the great transition from being a essentially authoritarian, even under the martial law, uh, kind of appointed president uh, to being directly elected, uh, this constitutional change, um, actually a series of constitutional changes uh, happened during his term uh, as the president, but he is also helped by the uh, people who fought, struggled for democracy, who um, started movements after movements uh, that fought for the freedom of the speech, freedom of the press, and so on. And I still remember how it was like to have no freedom of speech and freedom of the press. When I was young, both my parents were journalists, they have to self-censor a lot, and, and the review board uh, of the ruling party is unchallengeable, is entirely uh, opaque, uh, and whether something passed censors or not. Uh, and so this was not a happy time. Uh, and um, both because I think right after the Tiananmen uh, incident in Beijing, uh, where my dad was there, uh, actually until the 1st of June, um, fortunately, uh, and then uh, basically witnessed uh, how how bad it was when the government doesn't trust the citizens and the, the hope for reform is delayed, if not entirely lost uh, for, for a decade. Uh, and so when a very similar movement um, occupied the, the square in, in Taiwan asking for constitutional reform, President Lee uh, met um, the people, the students who occupied and promising essentially uh, to take their um, ideas, their demands into account. And the same um, scenario uh, would reappear back in uh, 2014. It was just six years ago when we occupied the parliament um, asking for more transparency and accountability when deliberating a cross-strait service and trade agreement with Beijing. Uh, at the time, the MPs were refusing to deliberate, uh, saying that it's a domestic matter because, you know, they're just West Taiwan or something. Uh, but <laughs> unlike international <laughs> treaties, uh, uh, but which would have required a full deliberation by the parliament. So they try to shortcut it. Uh, but the uh, citizens said no. So we occupied the MPs places and did the MPs work for them, which is deliberation. Uh, and more than 20 NGOs, many of them with roots in the original wild lily days, uh, when the martial law was lifted and uh, right after the Tiananmen uh, protest. Uh, the idea uh, is that their um, next generation, uh, the students of uh, this generation, um, learned from their uh, successfully uh, working um, 
campaigns from the civil right uh, workers that first fought for women's rights. Uh, for example, instead of marrying into a family, it's two individuals wed, and that's uh, generations of uh, women's rights um, advocates, uh, one of them being our uh, previously VP uh, Annette Liu uh, fought for, uh, and all the way into the more intersectional uh, rights, such as the rights for um, the uh, queer and transgender uh, people, and of course the first um, in Asia to legalize marriage equality uh, and define, redefine really, um, um, uh, like gender um, agnostic marriage as between two individuals, but not uh, between two families. So legalizing the uh, bylaws, but not the in-laws. Uh, and that's through two referendum and one constitutional court ruling. And so all this basically said to the citizen that if you don't like how parliament works, you can actually do the MP's job. You can go to the streets and instead of demonstration just as a protest, uh, demonstration as a demo, um, this is actually also what some of the uh, 15M <laughs> movement uh, in the municipal uh, area at the time, empowered by the internet, is saying, uh, is that it's a demo of a new kind of policy making where people can deliberate uh, and come to rough consensus on the street. And in the Taiwan case, it was very fortunate because, uh, again, just like Mr. Li Denghui did uh, back uh, around the time of the turn of century, uh, this time the head of parliament, uh, MP Wang Xinping, uh, did say that all the uh, occupiers demand uh, are met and he agreed to all of it and so after three weeks of occupy it was again a victory and the rough consensus of the decisions uh, made in the streets literally like in doing our 4g infrastructure we should not incorporate Beijing sponsored components even though they're branded as so-called private companies uh, when the state can replace leadership at will through its party branches we know that the total cost of ownership of uh, reassessing the systemic risk every upgrade is too high and so it doesn't actually make business sense uh, to include the PRC components in our 4G infrastructure and there was a consensus on the street and then taken into the consensus in the national communication commission and so we have been prc free uh, for the past six years if not more uh, and nowadays we're using 5g just fine uh, and we work of course with qualcomm nokia and ericsson and so on as well as developing our own 5g open ran technologies and so long story short i think this is about people having the empowerment of taking things into their own hands and also about wise leaders at the right moments at time saying that what the citizens mandate citizens will is at uh, in my heart and instead of my political will i will basically um adhere to the citizens will and, and that's true uh, democracy exactly uh, it's encouraging to see that, for instance, Taiwan uh, improved his position, its position in the World uh, Electoral Freedom Index. This is a, a global index that mm -hmm. analyzes virtually almost every country in, in the world that we are uh, conducting here at the Foundation for the Advancement of Liberty. And I remember several years ago, Taiwan was still in the red area mm -hmm. of insufficient electoral mm -hmm. freedom and now mm -hmm. has uh, let's say, come uh, in a much better position. They even, you, you, you even gained 12 uh, positions all of a sudden from one year to another, and you are now in the first green area of uh, at least uh, uh, going to, to, towards more, more electoral freedom. So uh, I want to uh, commend you for, for the efforts and, and the government mm -hmm. for the efforts uh, you're all doing in that uh, area because it is important, as you were saying, that uh, people to be empowered and to decide uh, in many, many aspects of their lives. After all, it's their lives, uh, not, uh, not the exactly. state. Exactly, not the state's lives. Exactly. exactly. Um, we've seen during this program how Taiwan uh, moved towards a free market economy, but um, we are now also seeing what is happening to uh, the neighboring Hong Kong what is happening with the new act uh, on security that uh, the regime from Beijing, the communist China, the dictatorship that you have as neighbor uh, is enforcing upon uh, this uh, ex-former uh, colony of the United Kingdom. What is uh, your relationship with Hong Kong? What thinks uh, the, the um, Taiwanese government uh, about this whole situation? How is it going to affect 
uh, let's say the the situation in in Taiwan now that uh, the Chinese government seems you know to harden uh, its line uh, over civil rights and and human rights in Hong Kong. Yeah, I, I still remember before ninety seven, uh, like around the democratization process in Taiwan in the eighties, late eighties, uh, and early nineties. Uh, the press freedom uh, in Hong Kong is one of the main ways the Taiwanese uh, people fighting for democracy and freedom at the time can voice our stories to the international world is through the free press uh, in the Hong Kong uh, jurisdiction, and uh, it's interesting how things have been reversed nowadays. Now it's Hong Kong people um, using the um, Taiwan as a free place uh, to run their previously um, um, harmonized uh, bookstores. The Tonglewan bookstore has moved to, to Taiwan. Uh, the um, Oslo Freedom Forum, of course, um, hosted um, in Taipei, uh, and I participated personally uh, last year, uh, provided a, a place for the Hong Kong anti-ELAP um, protesters, uh, a safe place to interact with the journalism community. The reporter Son Fortier, the reporter without borders, have its Asia headquarters now in Taipei, providing the correspondents um, a safe place to voice their opinions without fearing state uh, repercussions. And of course, nowadays, the uh, international NGOs that works on human rights and freedom and so on, uh, now uh, all are considering relocating, um, if not already, uh, their uh, base of operation from Hong Kong to Taiwan so that we even have a specific handbook for our international NGOs to register in Taiwan prepared jointly by our foreign service, the Taiwan Foundation of Democracy, uh, as well as the Minister of Interior. Uh, and so whether you want to register your international NGO as a office, as a civil association, as a foundation, um, the resident certificate, work permits, uh, tax exemption, and things like that. There's this a very simple, easy to remember uh, handbook and a dedicated office to walk you through that if you want to advocate for peace and democracy and civil liberties um, in the whole of Asia and uh, relocate or locate your new Asia or Pacific or Indo-Pacific office uh, in Taiwan. And that's uh, just a few things that we've been helping people working with Hong Kong and for Hong Kong a bit. Okay, so uh, it, I mean, it's, it's quite sad that Taiwan, for instance, uh, has, um, has it such difficult, uh, you know, to, to be in the, recognized as, as an independent, uh, free country, and, and yet you exist, you, you trade, uh, you, you are in a lot of relationship with all uh, the, the democracies in the world, but uh, they still have... Uh, a way to go uh, in order to recognize fully Taiwan, and it's a pity. How can we do to help correct this unjust uh, reality and uh, to try and, and move forward into a scenario where, where Taiwan, for instance, can be a full member of the World Health Organization? Uh, should have, if you if you were a member of this organization, maybe many uh, wrong things mm -hmm. that were done in the past months would have been solved, let's say, because of your expertise and of your knowledge of, of this uh, mm -hmm. current situation. Uh, the same mm -hmm. applies to any other international organization, the World mm -hmm. Trade Organizations and so on. How can we mm -hmm. do to make mm -hmm. more um, visible uh, the cause of Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so first of all, again, I will refer you to this YouTuber crossroads crowdfunded website, Taiwan can help that us, uh, and you can spread the message with the hashtag uh, Taiwan can help. That's it, right? Uh, and so this is a hashtag that is not uh, monopolized by the uh, official uh, ministries in Taiwan. This is a hashtag that anybody can use uh, to say that Taiwan provides essential help not only on health for all, but pretty much on all the 17 global goals. No matter which global goal you're working on, there's bound to be someone in Taiwan that have already thought about it, innovated and open about the innovations so that you can very easily work in a uh, cross-sectoral partnership. Because in Taiwan, we believe that the global goals are truly global 
And even though it's also called the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and we're not technically a member, um, there's already three municipalities, that's Taipei City, New Taipei City, and the newest one, literally just a few days ago, the Taoyuan City, joining in, uh, I think Taoyuan was the 17th, in a voluntary local review of the Sustainable Development Goals, outlining all the 17 different ways that it can help other cities in city-to-city -city relationships, uh, which is also a great thing to have. And also uh, the digital realm, of course, Taiwan is willing to help to uh, enhance reliable data. You mentioned if we have um, full ministerial access at the WHO, then the entire world can respond 10 days sooner uh, because we understood it's a human-to-human -human transmission um, earlier than pretty much everybody else and encourage effective partnerships uh, and also most importantly, open innovation because when we share the innovations, we share it in a way that um, respect the agency of other economies and jurisdictions. We wouldn't uh, like um, put people in a death trap or things like that. Uh, we share it with the open innovation in mind. Okay, uh, can you tell us about um, the new Taiwanese passport, uh, what implies from now on? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, uh, the legislature has uh, charged that the Ministry of Foreign Service uh, redesign our passport so that our passport uh, is more easily identifiable. Uh, and so if you want to take a look at the new passport coming, um, I think January the 1st, or sometime in January, anyway. Um, it, it looks like this. Okay. All right. So uh, to the left uh, is the old passport mm -hmm. uh, with the um, kanji, uh, the Han mm -hmm. character Zhonghua Mingguo, which to me always means uh, a transcultural republic of citizens, uh, because Mingguo is literal republic of citizens. Uh, but of course, um, with the letters Republic China, which was the original place where this idea of transculturalism and Republic of Citizens originated with Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Uh, and it also says Taiwan and passport underneath. Now, the new passport to the right uh, basically repeat uh, three times uh, the uh, official name of the country, but uh, it's in a circle. So you can choose to read uh, from any particular word. Uh, and then it still says the kanji, Zhonghua Mingguo, to me, the Transcultural Republic of Citizens, uh, but it puts Taiwan in the boat uh, so that it's less likely to be confused uh, with the PRC. Uh, but the official name uh, of the country, of course, is still around, uh, but you can also read it in um, other ways uh, as well, because it's uh, now like a, a, um, a wheel. Uh, and this is actually the, the latest consensus. Uh, more than three quarter of uh, Taiwanese people uh, agree that uh, like the Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan, literally the Transcultural Republic of Citizens Taiwan or ROC Taiwan uh, taken together um, is a identity that people are comfortable with. So it shows both uh, intergenerational solidarity uh, building, but also during the pandemic that we have more consensus um, as a um, nation of beautiful islands and swirling ocean uh, that there's instead of the two parts uh, like in two different identity in the same passport is the same more cohesive identity a more transcultural identity on the new passport so that's going to take effect and people can renew their cover starting next uh, January okay thank you very much minister uh, we we start now uh, some of the questions that uh, people send us uh, through whatsapp twitter on the youtube chat uh, we don't have much time because it was a, an intense and very very interesting uh, interview with you uh, you had a lot to say and <laughs> we didn't want to miss anything so uh, we are going to try and be as uh, as resumed as possible with everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's answer, for instance, Alejandro Mulet on YouTube asks you whether the Taiwan government is considering any type of e-residency such as the Estonian government put in place. Yeah, I, I mentioned Taiwan Gold Card which is even better than e-residency. It's a full residency, uh, right? Uh, so of course uh, you can convert your tourism visa 
into a gold card uh, if you work on E whatever. Uh, and uh, I think this is a, a really, really sweet deal uh, because um, first of all, it's renewable uh, and you can stay for three years and then reapply for another three years. Uh, and um, if there's a very easy, again, not built by the government. These are built by um, the thousands of people who already have a gold car and want to introduce it to other people. Uh, and so, um, yeah, you can join the gold car community at townguildcar.com. You can check whether you qualify for the gold car, go through the application process and discover the community. And I think you'll find uh, that in addition to the digital uh, banking and so on and access to the single European market that the Estonian e, um, holder, uh, e card holder um, enjoys, uh, this card actually offers um, many more things uh, and uh, you don't have to give up your own passport to become also Taiwanese uh, and to enjoy the, the, the life in Taiwan and including, of course, the health insurance, the um, uh, very tele-friendly labor law. Uh, the, um, your family also enjoys uh, these uh, ideas uh, and uh, regards as well. And also, if you uh, are working on cutting-edge technology, um, Taiwan really offers a really good sandbox uh, for you to showcase your technology, try it out with a early adopter-minded community and see whether the idea works or you can co-create with our society. That's what happens, for example, with Uber, which is now a legal taxi fleet in Taiwan called Q Taxi, but in doing this, uh, promoted the existing taxi fleets and co-ops and so on to be uh, now app-based and enjoy search pricing and other innovative techniques that's only possible with a electronic, or not really electronic, with a digital meter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you opt uh, to this kind of uh, residency also while living outside Taiwan? For mm -hmm. instance, if I'm in Spain and I want to mm -hmm. opt in for the, mm -hmm. the residency mm -hmm. of Taiwan, uh, mm -hmm. do I have to go there physically and uh, mm -hmm. ask for it, mm -hmm. for the permit, or mm -hmm. can I do all the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the formalities mm -hmm. from my home here mm -hmm. in Spain? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, of course, uh, if you uh, don't plan to stay in Taiwan at all, um, Technically, I guess uh, you can work uh, to get the foreign citizens digital certificate through one of our um, embassies or uh, representative offices. But that's going to be quite limited use to you because mm -hmm. we don't have a single European market for you to get yeah. access to. I mean, you can already do business in Taiwan as a foreign person in a foreign company. There's a specific section of company law that, uh, and even if you're an NGO worker, I just show you the yeah. uh, handbook for setting up a representative office in, in Taiwan. And so, um, yeah, the, the main uh, impetus to get the Estonian uh, e-citizen card, which is the access to the bank uh, recognized in the EU single market, um, simply doesn't make sense in Taiwan's case. Mm -hmm. But if you decide to, of course, stay in Taiwan for a while, then, of course, it makes sense for you to apply for the gold card because it doesn't say that you have to have a Taiwanese employer. It doesn't say that you have to, um, you know, uh, give this much um, investment or any sort of uh, um like uh, either in capital or in hiring Taiwanese people, it says nothing like that. It only says that you're a foreign talent that we want to stay in Taiwan more. Uh, and, and that's the main message. Um, and it's harder to find a safer place on Earth right now, except maybe for Antarctica. Uh, Taiwan is maybe the, the safest place at the moment. So that's our main, main lure. And also the food and bubble tea. Uh, let's go to Twitter. Ilanit asks you about surrogacy. It would be interesting to know how the legalization proposal progresses in Taiwan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a uh, interesting question. Uh, Very surrogacy... short answer, uh, Audrey, because we are running out of time. <laughs> uh, okay, right. So, so, uh, so I will be brief. So, uh, if surrogacy uh, does it mean by like women having a baby for another woman who is unable to do so? by herself yes um okay right so um unfortunately that's one part of the legislation that's uh quite controversial in taiwan and so we do not have surrogacy uh, arrangement that taiwanese people who require surrogacy and so on um at the moment um have to uh work with uh overseas partners uh but uh the um 
like regenerative and uh, the like uh, if you have difficulty giving uh, birth to to children and so on fertility tourism uh, that's actually a, a really uh, strong thing uh, in Taiwan so um, like if you instead of working on uh, surrogacy uh, working on fertility tourism uh, Taiwan is uh, your good uh, destination, but maybe not that good a destination at the moment, uh, if you are considering a career as a professional surrogate. Uh, let's go to a question on WhatsApp. Is Taiwan using AI for security purposes, airports, mall, etc.? Uh, do you have an, any agenda for it? And uh, also, I'm going to relate to questions. Uh, what do you think about the gossip that associate COVID or other health related issues with the 5G tech? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the first thing uh, about assistive intelligence uh, used in the context of uh, border security, um, there's a few things. Nowadays, if you go back to Taiwan uh, or visit Taiwan, uh, you have to uh, spend 14 days in quarantine. And there is a lot of AI to enforce that quarantine. Um, and you either go to a physical quarantine hotel and stay for 14 days, or you can stay at your own place if you have your own uh, bathroom, but then your phone, or if you don't have a phone, uh, you, the uh, government gives you one for 14 days, and we pay you um, around 30 euros a day as a stipend for staying in the digital quarantine. Uh, but then uh, a chatbot, a AI, is going to check uh, how you feel, mm -hmm. uh, whether you're enjoying yourself, are there sufficient cute dog memes um, for you to enjoy during those 14 days, uh, is the internet working well, and so on, uh, and to, to care uh, for you. But if uh, your phone goes out of uh, the digital fence perimeter, which is not determined by GPS or any the more invasive top-down technology, but rather it is just by the signal strength of the telecom towers, which they are already collecting anyway for roaming services. So if you break outside of that 50 or so meter radius, a AI will send an SMS to the local health workers and police institutions to check your whereabouts and whether you you know, are still in the quarantine. And if you break out of quarantine, well, you'll be fined 1,000 times of the stipend, so you can fund 1,000 times more people, I guess. Uh, so, so people don't break out of the quarantine. And that's why we very successfully, we thank the people who received the stipend and stay in the quarantine and work with those AI chatbots. Uh, but uh, all in all, it enabled a very limited uh, staff to manage a very large amount of people in home quarantine and by and large uh, preserve the freedom and liberty of movement for people who already finished the quarantine and for people who have not traveled abroad. So I think it's a really good use of AI in an ethical way and maximally privacy preserving because we've not declared an emergency state at exactly. all. So everything we do need to be based on existing collected data and its use and purpose need to be subject to the parliamentary oversight and interpolation. Let's go to another quick question on online education. Uh, did you have previous to the COVID an already extended online education access mm -hmm. for your yes. school system or did you have to improvise a little bit with the whole uh, COVID-19 situation? Well, you see, even when we delayed the opening of the schools, the semester for a couple of weeks to make sure there's sufficient uh, soap, hand sanitizer and mask in all schools, the schools never closed. We, we never had a lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, so the, the tele-education we already had is more like the digital opportunity centers in the more rural and remote islands and less connected places. And these are put into good use uh, when large gatherings uh, are discouraged and people are in smaller satellite classrooms, but we never uh, go into the lockdown mode where uh, the students have to spend uh, their time alone at home. So uh, by the border quarantine uh, use of assistive intelligence. I just answered in the previous uh, question. I did not have to answer this question because the school never had the lockdown. Okay, uh, another one, and this is the, the let's let's try and, and answer as brief as possible. Also on YouTube, uh, Alejandro Mulet. In your opinion, Minister, what is the biggest challenge that is facing the Taiwanese people right now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Um, I think at the moment, uh, the biggest challenge uh, is that, as you mentioned, in multilateral organizations, um, our um, seeds and identities are keep being misrepresented and silenced over and, quote unquote, 
harmonized uh, from those multilateral organizations. On the other hand, there are emerging minilateral organizations, such as the Global Cooperation and Training Framework. Um, recently, of course, the APEC is also playing a, a good role for us on the international stage. Uh, emerging hybrid organizations that are both multilateral and multi-stakeholder, such as the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Network of Academics or the Open Government Partnership. Uh, this provides a more equitable access for Taiwan on the international stage. Uh, and that is, of course, something that we look uh, and aspire to contribute more to. But uh, a traditional multilateral, like 170 member countries, that sort of organization, that is still the main challenge. And that would need, of course, both the diplomatic support of fellow liberal democracies, but it also needs support from those international multilateral uh, organizations themselves. Uh, the work, the principles that they work with uh, needs to uh, be deliberated and make sure that the very weird things, for example, just by nature of uh, the Wikimedia Foundation that runs Wikipedia, have a chapter called Wikimedia Taiwan. Uh, the PRC um, uh, member of the uh, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, motioned to block Wikimedia Foundation and Wikipedia to be observer in the WIPO simply because they have a chapter called Wikimedia Taiwan. And so that sort of thing uh, has a collateral to all the people working on digital freedom and civil liberties. I mean, uh, it's basically bullying the Wikimedia Foundation to reclassify, I don't know, Wikimedia Taiwan as uh, a provincial chapter or something like that, uh, or uh, face the exclusion uh, from WIPO, where many of the sibling organizations of Wikimedia Foundation are already a member and observer of. So uh, more people need to be aware of this uh, and share the hashtag Taiwan can help. Exactly. Uh, one final question, uh, Victor uh, posted on YouTube. I'm going to translate it because he, he wrote it in Spanish. Do you believe uh, that sometimes in the future uh, we will know the true origin of the COVID virus uh, 19? This is yeah, kind I of conspiranoid. I, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 yeah I, I certainly hope so. Uh, I mean, um, at some point, of course, we'll look back uh, and reconstruct exactly where the virus came from, how it, um, you know, gets there in the first place. Uh, but I think, uh, meanwhile, uh, it's also important uh, just to repeat what the spokesdog say, to wear your mask, to protect you from your own and washed hands. And I wish you live long and prosper. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, this was uh, quite a, uh, an interesting uh, program today. We are going to uh, do more like uh, this leaders program in the future. So I hope you all can join us in, in next episode of, of this program that is made by the Foundation for the Advancement of Liberty. In the meanwhile, I ask all of you to make the cause of Taiwan well known all, all over uh, your communities, in your families, your friends, at your uh, workplace, because I believe Taiwan is, is an example of a country where people can live their lives freely, can innovate, can work, and uh, they even uh, show an immense solidarity towards us and towards many countries that are now under this uh, difficult situation created by the health cri healthcare crisis with the COVID-19, but that uh, clearly derived in an economic crisis even worse than that of uh, 2008. So uh, without uh, any other considerance, thank you very much, Audrey Tang, for this uh, time mm -hmm. you had with us. And um, share this content, follow us on our social media, uh, share, subscribe, of course, to youtube.com slash Fundali and stay safe till our next program. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Bye.